We're live. We're live. Hello. Hello. See if I can get this pulled up over here too. So, hey guys, it's Rachel with Be Healed Dog hey. Training, and Sarah is here as well. And apparently, Clyde is saying hello back there. <laughs> Um, so Sarah and I are doing this weekly live, YouTube live, where we're just kind of talking about stuff. So this is our second one, um, and we're doing this remotely this time, connecting up separately. Sarah, if you want to say hi, you can hello, jump in. And hello. I'm saying hi on the chat right now, just to let everybody know. Um, <laughs> just to let everybody know. Um, <laughs> so last week, as we so were talking, week, kind, we were of talking everybody kind of jumped everybody in. jumped in. Afterwards, and if Afterwards, anybody's on and, if anybody's and, wants, on to ask a and wants to ask a question, you know, as we're, you know, as, as we're going, we're, feel free to type it in the chat and I'll interject it as we go. Perfect. Cause as, as of now I cannot see chat. I'm going to see if I'm sitting at my old laptop and let me tell you, this thing does not work well. I'm on my phone, so I can't pull it up on my phone. My old laptop, I will probably be logging onto YouTube by the time we're finished. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is pretty much dead. So I can't see the chat right now, but Sarah's going to um, update me on any questions that are asked or things that are being said, and pretty much we're just going to be talking about thresholds today um, and discussing what it means to keep a dog under threshold or go over threshold. So um, I guess we'll just start with talking about what it is that we're talking about with being at threshold. As I get the dog situated here, I've got five dogs in the room right now, so and they just came in and they're getting settled down. So I want to make sure everyone's nice and quiet and calm. Um, actually, for those of you who are watching live, you can see we've got Kronk over here and Storm. Cla actually, that's May. Clyde's in the back there <laughs> over by the doorway. And I feel like I'm missing someone. Belle. Belle's over here. Licking the you floor. Of, licking the floor. <laughs> you lose track of... Oh, she's licking your nails. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> she bites her nails. What? And she's definitely what? my dog. Yeah, she bites her nails. Anybody else out there have dogs who bite their nails? I I've heard of a few. I've had a couple boarders who come and do it. I actually, I've caught Kronk doing it a few times, too. So dogs do it, too. Um, but anyway, so back to threshold. There's a lot of talk out there about keeping dogs under threshold. And again, I'm going to kind of jump into the positive-only world. I have a feeling that's going to happen a lot on these things. And the only reason I'm doing that is not necessarily to bash the positive-only world, but to address a lot of the misinformation that's coming out of that, because that's a very trendy training concept right now is the idea that we only ever use positive reinforcement, that we should never be using negative reinforcement or punishment as our dogs. And it's just not an effective way of training. It's not a realistic way of training. It doesn't work very well. So um, in the positive only world, when we talk about correcting unwanted behaviors, a lot of times their approach is to keep the dog under threshold at all times. And what that means is basically not allowing them to hit or go above threshold. And that means like being triggered by something, you know, they reach their threshold of what they can tolerate before they react or before they get fearful. And so, um, what's talked about is keeping the dog below threshold, meaning they never reach that trigger point. And you can probably already see why that's not so realistic because, you know, when you have a dog that gets reactive to other dogs, that means that you should never have your dog around other dogs. So that means you can't take your dog out on a walk because if you pass by another dog, you're putting your dog above threshold. Um, and this is talked about a lot in fearful dogs, dogs who lack confidence. And the thing is, the world is not going to cater to your dog. The world is not going to stay at this certain level for your dog's sake. So actually really important to purposefully put your dog above threshold and work them through that. Um, so just to, it's, it's kind of hard not having Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything that you want to so far up to this point? Cause I'll just ramble on for the whole hour, but well, I mean, I, anything well, I mean, you want I, to jump in about? I think one of the things, and we, we, talked, a we, we week, talked a little bit about this last week when we were kind of doing our, our, kind of doing our, our little research, our looking, research for, looking for, you know, somebody dealing you know, with a reactive dog, dog, dog and we couldn't really find, really find a, a start, start to finish at least finish beginning of a, beginning of a process or whatever. process or whatever. But, right. but I think one of the things is, I remember seeing, like we talked about one site where they're like, you know, hey, take your dog out, take your dog out, 
you know, before humans before or humans anyone or else is outside. Else is like, outside. I don't know like, I don't know how. We don't work that yeah. way. We don't work they don't that way. work that they way. Don't work you that know, way. And, and you know, and, and we've talked about this a little bit. In fact, Rachel experienced it the other day. So, you know, we have Portia. You know, we have Portia. You know, Rachel came here. Well, Portia has started. She's pretty good when we're out. pretty good when we're out. But but my dog is starting to be slightly, you know, reactive to people coming into our home. So if home. I mean, so what's the response I mean, to what's that? The response if we don't to that? ever, if we so, don't ever, so the deal so, is, so you know, deal unfortunately, is, we, had you know, we had a good friend who has dogs, who has very dogs, used to them, and who's used to them, training his own dog, so he was, would take was, my suggestions that came over a couple days later, and we were actually able to work through it a little bit, you know, every time, it might come time, we work through it a little bit. If you can't work you through can't it and go, hey, look, I know this thing is making you anxious. You don't know what's going you on. But let's show you that it's let's okay. And let's show you we get to the other side in a positive way. How? I mean, what am I supposed to do? Not have people come to my home? Not have people come to my home? Exactly. And and going back to using Storm as an example, and if you guys watched last week, the episode is mostly talking about Storm. That's not going to be the case today. But she's still here. She's one of my born and trained dogs right now. And she is a four or five month old puppy that came in three weeks ago with some pretty serious reactivity and really getting on into actual aggression. And her triggers were people talking the moment she saw people, you know, she was barking and lunging and it's like, okay. And it was because she was uncomfortable with them. Okay. So if the response is to keep her at threshold, she never sees another person outside of her family member because it makes her uncomfortable. Like that's just not realistic. Right. Um, right. And so going into kind of the confidence building world, um, there's lots of ways, lots and lots and lots of ways that, that you can be working to build confidence with your dog. And, yeah. and one of my, um, kind of biggest go-tos with confidence is to find the thing that makes the dog uncomfortable and go do it. So I have kind of the opposite. Well, and actually I talked to a client just the other day and she was talking to me about her dogs being terrified of thunderstorms. So there you go. How do you keep a dog under threshold of thunderstorms? Two blocks down because my dogs are scared. Right. Well, right, you're not making them feel better, right? Right. When we talk about, I think, I <laughs> stop. I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, that's actually a weird sound. No, no. Um, sorry about that, guys. So there's something actually kind of odd sound-wise going on outside. I have a feeling it's just my kids getting home. So <laughs> <laughs> not that really weird, but I, I think the kids are home and play around and stuff. Um, okay, so take me back to what we're just talking about. We're talking about thunderstorms, thunderstorms and thunderstorms. right. Yes. And how the thunderstorm is not going to wait. So, so my response to, you know, my response to this person was basically what's happening is she said they'll be out on a walk and the fireworks too. And this year, she mentioned fireworks are just going on and on and on. And I've noticed that here too. I guess it's people bored on the quarantine. Like, hey, let's buy triple the fireworks and just keep setting them off. Um, but she said she would have her dogs out on a walk. And then a firework would go off, and she was basically being drugged all the way home. Just because she has two great Pyrenees great that are terrified. Oh, so gosh. Now she's wow. to hold on. <laughs> right. So she's pretty much just holding on for dear life and being drugged home. And so we talked about, well, how do we address that? And, and my response is, you know, again, we talk about all these different pieces. You teach the dog a good heel. You teach the, the dog a heel to the point that you actually can correct them and they're not in a heel. And then you would actually go out, and if these things are occurring, you would correct the dog for breaking command. So, you know, firework goes off, dog breaks heel because they take off to try to get home, you would actually punish that behavior. And you're not punishing them for being afraid, 
but you are giving up pleasure for breaking the known command, which is the heel command. Right, um, right. Um, and so we talked about that, and also the fact that when you're dealing with fear, and especially high levels of fear, those corrections are probably going to have to be a good bit higher than what your normal corrections are to break the command. Gotcha. Um, and a lot of times we're afraid to do that. We're afraid to correct fearful dogs. Um, common misconception, it is said a lot out there that, uh, is, again, typically in the positive only world, that if you correct a fearful dog, you're going to make them more fearful. And it's like the dog is already dragging the owner home. And you're not going to make them more fearful because you correct them. Again, when you're doing this in a methodical way, in methodical way, meaning you've taught the dog the heel command, they know what they're supposed to be doing, you've already practiced correcting the dog for biting heel in calmer scenarios. Um, and so they already know what everything means. They know what the correction means and what they're supposed to do with it, so that when you have them in this more kind of extreme case of something they're very fearful of, you correct high, the dog knows what they're supposed to do. And the, what that looks like on the other side of that is, you know, dog might go, okay, there's fireworks. And when I run home, the fireworks stop, and then I'm safe. And what we need to learn is that actually, if you stay in a heel with me, you're still going to be safe. Yes, it's loud, but we're not being harmed. And when the dog runs away, they never get a chance to understand that they're not going to be harmed. It's just a loud noise, so we want to desensitize them to that. So when you wreck the dog and don't allow them to run away anymore, then what you end up with is a dog that is probably looking fairly nervous because they're still uncomfortable, but they are actually going to heal. Um, and then you're able to continue your walk, you continue your exposure to whatever the trigger is. We're talking about fireworks and thunder right now, but it could be anything. Um, so... Then when you can practice that exposure, then you start to get a dog who is actually calmer and actually okay with the situation. And my suggestion, you know, to this person, because you can't really predict thunder and fireworks, and you can't really necessarily get a ton of exposure to that unless it's Fourth of July week and the week after, and people are setting them off every night. So then my my next suggestion to her was teach your dog to place command. Teach them the command really well in a calm environment. Teach them to stay in that command even with some distractions. Get them to the point that you correct them if they break the place command. I don't remember that at all. Yeah. So, um, so we, Rachel, it looks like we have a question and just so you know, if I'm not talking a lot, it's, I think we've got some echoing going on. I'm getting some chat comments about echoing, but, um, so we do have a question here that says, hello, what can I do to take my reactive dog's focus off a trigger if he ignores e-collar and prong corrections? Ah.
Well, and well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, looking here, here, it looks like, like so, and, I, and I'm not, not sure, sure, so guys, bear with us, because this is the first time that we have um, done a feed this way, so <laughs> um, I think they're having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Rachel. I can hear you here, but I'm not sure they can hear you very well on the feed, so I don't know if you can turn the mic volume up on your Skype. Well, it may be frozen, so if everybody wants to, to bear with me for just a second, let me drop Rachel and see if I can pick her back up. <laughs> Hang on a second. Guys, it may look weird here for just a second. We're going to uh, see what happens, see if I can't add her back and have it do something intelligent here. If I am smart enough to do this. Well, I reconnected you, and, and now, now there's just a black screen. screen. <laughs> Never like I went away. You did, did go away. Yeah. Hang, on Hang on a second. second. Okay. Well, well, and I, I might, might have, have to... to... Hang on. Okay, so I've got one person saying they can hear. So at, least so at least if we can hear, I can keep talking. I'm good at that. Well, so I just so added I her back. back. So guys, tell me tell how, how that works. works. All right, well, we'll try this. Thank, thanks, guys, again, for, for bearing with the technical stuff. Um, and also, if you hear very loud snoring in the background, that is compliments of storm. I actually had to wake her up the other day before I could do a Skype call because she was snoring so loud that we <laughs> couldn't hear each other consult there. So we'll see. Um, all right. So hopefully we're back up and, and running better now. Awesome. Okay. I'm getting people saying you're back. So, okay. So um, going back to, we're going to talk about Gus Gus again, because Gus Gus is just such a great example of putting a dog over threshold and how, like, he wouldn't have had a chance if I didn't. Um, because his threshold was so low that everything basically was above well, threshold. Well, so, and you he were got talking, I'm going to interrupt you for one second, Rachel. Even if I'm echoing, guys, I'm sorry. But um, because I don't think everybody could hear you talking about having to, like, drag him up the... Okay, sure. So I'll just kind of recap with that in case that was missed before. So I had a dog, Gus Gus, a couple years ago in my board and train. Um, hands down, the most fearful dog I've worked with up to this point. Um, and he was a coon hound that was terrified of the outdoors. So, um, And I'm talking, walking him from just my front door out to the potty spot and back. He would be belly down to the pavement in my driveway, clawing at the pavement, trying to get back to the house. And this was every day for a week, at least. Um, and even after that first week, just being outside, he was very jumpy. He was um, terrified to work outside at all. Um, basic corrections as far as once he learned his commands and then would be corrected for breaking commands, he was maxing out my remote collar. I ended up having to go to the next higher level collar, the boss by, by e Collar Technologies. He was the most fearful dog I've worked with, and he was also, he received probably the highest level punishers. Um, fearful dogs usually end up getting higher level punishers than like aggressive dogs because, um, Joy, that's your dog. Yeah, I mean, fear is hard. Fear is a very hard thing to work with. Um, and, you know, there are just so many people out there that say you should not correct a fearful dog. You should not punish a fearful dog. You should not flood a fearful dog and flooding just meaning like putting them, you know, fully immersing them into the situation they're afraid of. And it's like, 
if you don't, what's left to do? Because you're not going to motivate the dog enough with treats and reward and praise. You're not going to coddle them out of it. I'm not a fan of trying to um, coddle and baby talk and soothe a fearful dog. And it's not because I'm not compassionate, but it's because to me, if a dog is nervous about something and I start talking to them in this tone of voice of like, hey, buddy, it's okay, it's okay. Like me changing that tone of voice almost justifies that they should be afraid of something. It's kind of like, oh, you know, you're talking to me like I should be afraid. So, yeah. Instead, I'd rather treat it like very nonchalant. Be like, hey, dude, it's fine. You know, sometimes you need that friend that's like, chill. It's cool. It's all good. And we're not yelling and screaming and like, you can't be afraid. But it's more like, hey. It's fine. Um, and as far as motivating that dog, again, you run out of rewards that are going to motivate him. So, you know, getting him to go on a walk, getting him to walk in a heel outside going down the street, could not walk him at all, period. They could not. They couldn't make it past their driveway because he would just put his claws in, dig his heels in, and they couldn't get him to take another step. So he was limited to the inside of his house and his backyard, which he would only barely go into long enough to pee and rush to the back door. And that was his life. Um, and and they had gotten him as an adult from a shelter. So it was like they got him and he put on a little weight and became his true self. And they were like, oh, my gosh, what is this dog? <laughs> like, What's going on here? Um, so anyway, like talking about the whole concept of rewarding them out of the behavior. He was also one of the most food driven dogs I have ever worked with. Um, and even that, like there would be times that he would just refuse to take food because he was too afraid. So how do you work with a dog who doesn't take food, doesn't give a shit about you petting them, doesn't want you to cuddle them because they're too afraid they want to run. What's left? Like, like, Making them right. <laughs> correct, you know, like you run out of stuff and um, and you're not going to make them more afraid by correcting behavior. Because they're, I mean, he's already maxed out on fear. Like, fear. Like, and how his story ended as far as his board and train is he was with me for, for five weeks and he... By the end of it, was off leash trained. Um, one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken is of him running in the snow, and he's got like all four legs up and all this snow underneath him, and he's just bounding and playing. And it's like snow is the kind of thing that would have just terrified him before. Talk about a major crazy environmental for a dog who's afraid of the outside to come outside. And we had nine inches of snow on the ground, and he was afraid of it at first, but we worked him through it. And all of a sudden, next thing I know, he's like, "This stuff's awesome!" And that was like really. off leash and have that was the first time I saw him have fun like he truly had fun um but again getting to that process he was terrified of traffic noises so like we talked about a little bit earlier I would put him on put him on place and I would play traffic sounds from my phone under the pet cot and he kept bolting off of place he'd get a correction for breaking place he'd get sent back to place over and over at least you know a couple times until he goes okay not worth it to break place and then he would sit there in place and be just kind of shaking and nervous and then over time he'd be relaxed and eventually he'd sleep and then the next time we would have a session he'd start off and he'd maybe break place once or twice and then eventually he'd sleep and um it got to the point to where we went on a walk in downtown louisville and his owners, um, a couple, like a month or two after he had gone home, sent me an update of him camping. Oh, wow. And he was in a downstay, hanging out with them at the campsite. So all of that to say is that it works. Like, don't be afraid to put your dogs in these situations and work them through it. And it's not just throwing them out there. You're guiding well, them. You are and I'm going to, I want yeah, so you to tell them what you were telling me over the weekend. And I'm sorry if I'm speaking sorry, slowly, but everybody keeps everybody saying I'm, my, my voice is screwed up. <laughs> but yeah, what you were telling me over the weekend about Storm and your field trip and, you know, kind of how you exposing Storm has, has gotten there. Yeah. Yeah, so so Storm, um, again, I'm not sure where the sound got screwy earlier. So Storm's a board and train that I have with me um, who came here with some 
some serious reactivity and aggression problems. Um, four or five month old puppy, it's not even that she had like negative experience. It's how she was. She was a secure dog. And up to this point, she learned that being aggressive worked to keep people at bay. So that's what she's doing. So she came here. All that behavior was corrected. But then she was taught exactly what to do. We did lots of leadership stuff, lots of, you know, walking in a heel, working on place, um, threshold training as far as door thresholds. Um, and so then we, what I did was initially she and I were the only ones we worked in very calm, calm quiet environments because at that point, even that was way above threshold for her, um, coming in for her board and train in that first session with me, she was terrified. All she did for the, the entire first session I worked with her was you know, me or try to bite me. Well, and um, show her right now because you have her in there right now, right? Um, let's see, which one is she? She is right there. That's Storm hanging out there. Hey, Storm. Um, Storm's my buddy now, man. We're, we're pals. Me working with her at all put her above the threshold and let me trying to like kneel down on the floor and hold out treats for her was not gonna fly. She was like, F you, get away from me. I'm terrified. And if you crouch down, I'm going to go for your face. <laughs> like, so there was no petting. There was no trying to win her over with affection. There was no, um, there was trying to just do basic leash work and get her to follow me even at a little bit of distance. But then also right from the beginning, correcting any of those unwanted behaviors, lunging, barking, all of that. And so after we got a good start with that, then we got to do all the fun stuff, all the reward based, like teaching the commands. And that was all through positive reinforcement. You know, yes, click food. You're doing the right thing. Taught her all of her basic commands. And then um, those when I started using like Sarah, helped my husband, Richard helped me out where um, I would have them approach us and initially and when she started making better choices, what I mean by that is, is what would happen. And we got a great video showing me approach that would put uh, storm above threshold. So, so then like we reached this point, Sarah's in the house, she's over here doing her own thing. Storm is fine. Okay, Sarah, let's work on this. She comes over here. There comes a point where Storm is aware that Sarah is here and she's not okay. She's at threshold. Right. Sarah comes a little closer. Storm is totally not okay. At that point, the way she used to handle that when she was above threshold is she would bark and lunge and carry on. And guess what? It had worked for her because how many people are going to keep approaching that dog? Um, instead, the... Uh, when she was above threshold, she's going, hold on a second. The barking lunging stuff, not going so well for me. So now what do I do? Well, I want to run and hide. I was okay with that. And by run and hide, she wasn't like bolting away. She would tuck herself behind me and kind of like, like okay, what I wanted. And so then by the end of that session, Sarah was able to approach and Storm was like, hey, we're cool. Like she wasn't tucking herself behind me anymore. And so now she's no longer above threshold because we had worked her through that to where we could do the just repeated exposure. Sarah approaches, click, you get food. Sarah approaches, click, you get food. And she goes, approaching is actually a pretty cool thing. And next thing you know, she's taking treats out of Sarah's hand. Um, so that ultimately, ultimately resulted in taking her out to um, Lowe's and PetSmart the other day. And talking crowds of people, shopping carts, forklifts, children. Um, she's a freaking rock star. And I'm really bad. I've not gotten the video up yet. I'm working on it, I swear. I'm going to do that tonight. Um, but she walked around all sorts of people. She never barked once. She never lunged once. She was in a soft heel. Um, at one point, we were cleaning up a mess on the floor. And an employee came over. And I had Storm in a downstay. And the employee reached over her to hand me some paper towels. And she didn't care. The cool thing was it wasn't just because here's another thing that, you know, the positive only trainers who say that you shouldn't correct these behaviors will try to tell you that if you punish the behaviors, you're going to repress it and that the, it'll just come out stronger in, in some seemingly unprovoked way. And that's a load of crap. 
Um, what I was seeing in her body language was she was not even concerned with this guy. No side eye, no tension. She just kind of looked up at him, looked around the store, like didn't care that he was there. And that is what our goal is, is when we work these dogs through their above threshold issues and teach them how to cope and make better decisions when they're feeling overwhelmed, then not only can they cope better and make better choices, but their threshold lowers. And that right? Lowers, raises, raises, it I raises. guess, to technically be right. better. Yeah. Raises. Yeah. Yeah, it's like exposure therapy. I mean, it's a thing for people and dogs, I think. Yeah. And Rachel, you've got a couple of, and again, guys, I apologize if I'm echoey. I think I'm, Rachel, I think I'm coming through your speakers. <laughs> but uh, I've tried to kind of adjust my volume. But um, so um, Joy says her dog is actually scared of the clicker. And then Timothy's got some questions on the length of the, of the e-collar prongs. Okay, I can see those, so I'll read those in a second. Joy, if your dog is scared of the clicker, and so good example, Kronk, when I first, he, I don't know if you know, if you guys know his story, but he showed up in my backyard, essentially, at our old house. He was just kind of in the woods one day, and it took three weeks to catch him. He was extremely fearful. So talk about above threshold, like, that's that dog, too. He was terrified of anything that involved people. Um, when I started clicker training him, no, please. Was and that's that. a correction, um, you guys, for the record. Yeah, that's, that's what the correction looks like. I just tapped her on the remote and, like, look, she's fine. She's back on place. Actually, she needs to be in a down. Nope. No. So that was a correction. You saw it live. It's no big deal. It's not supposed to be. Sometimes it needs to be. Don't get me wrong. But um, Kronk was really afraid of the clicker. And so what I did is I would put his food down and I would just sit beside him and click it while he ate. I didn't like, Come up real close. They make soft clickers. I actually own a soft clicker, and I love that for the real sensitive dog. So I started him on a soft clicker. Um, you can use a ballpoint pen if you get one that's just a little bit quieter of a click than the loud clicker. So you can try those things. Um, so let's see. We've got questions about Doberman e-collar. Um, yeah, you're, for a Doberman, your short contact points are probably going to work best. Um, let me see. If they're barely lighting the tester, I would just contact the company. Let's see. So there, there should have been, um, Timothy, in your collar when you ordered it, there should have been two pairs of contact points, a short and a long. And then it comes with the tester, like you said. So if it's not really lighting up the tester, and another way you can test is test on yourself. Um, sometimes with the dog, it's hard to know if it's actually working because another issue could be that if the collar is not properly fitted, that they're not feeling the stem appropriately. So you can um, test it on yourself and see if you're getting a consistent stem. And you can put that in the palm of your hand or you can put that up near your kind of um, the crook of your elbow there where they would draw blood from. Those are two spots that you can put it and just test it. Um, but if you think they're not working, just contact the company. They've got excellent customer service and they'll, they'll send you another pair. So um, anyway... What else do we have about threshold? Um, oh, and I've got another question that just came in. Okay, so it sounds like if he's real sensitive, Joy, to sounds, um, um, what we're talking about, it sounds like a lot of things put him above that threshold point, and you want to desensitize him to it. So you can do that through lots of counter conditioning. Have him on a leash um, when you're working with him so that he can't just run away from the sound. You would have him on a leash, and um, if he does try to, like, bolt, he can only go so far. Um, and then you can just click and reward, and if his normal food isn't cutting it, you can get some, like, super delicious treats and try that. But, yeah, get you the, the soft clicker and just kind of condition him that way. Um, and even with Kronk, having to start with a soft clicker, I'm sure eventually he's fine. So you can work him through that. What else? Do we have any other questions from anybody out there? Or Sarah, if you have any anything to add, I'm just trying not to talk or... too much because I know everybody says I'm, my audio is distorting so bad. Well, I'm putting my volume down even lower, so hopefully it's not getting as much of that <laughs> echo back stuff going on. Of course, now I can barely hear you, but that's okay. It's Technical issues. Fine, is right? We're just gonna have to both be in, in headphones if we're gonna do this this way or something. I don't know. Yeah, true. I guess you gotta get me um, some Well, I don't know. Although that may be the problem. I, who knows? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. I mean, you know, 
it's, I, mean, I think the point is the same, is that when you're comparing, you know, it's like, it's like we keep talking about, you know, it, balanced training includes the positive training. I mean, you know, they do get rewards, they do get praise, they get fun and play and, right, yeah, I mean, they get more praise than they get anything, but I don't know how you teach them what doesn't work, and I don't know how you teach them how to get past, I mean, it's just like any of us, you know, if, if you're, if you're struggling with something, you know, and, and you were to go to a counselor, and we kind of joke a lot that we're, you know, therapists for dogs, <laughs> But I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, if you were to go to a counselor because you're having huge anxiety around driving a car, they're not going to look at you and say, well, you should just never drive a car again because, you know, right. they might look at Because it makes the world really small and you can't push right, it. Right. I mean, yeah. that's, that, so, I mean, I know I do that a lot, but I really feel like there's so much correlation between us as people and, and dogs and thresholds, you know, I mean, like I said, we're having to deal with it. You know, that's what's so funny, you know, right? It's, we talk about the cobbler's, the cobbler's kids not having any shoes or whatever. It's not, not entirely true. Yeah. But I mean, we do, yeah. you know, we have to deal with the same things. I have a five and a half month old puppy who has decided it wants to bark its face off at everyone who comes in the door. She's not attacking anybody, but it certainly doesn't make people comfortable. You know, sure. and you don't want to have no. to deal with it. No, I, don't want, I certainly don't want my visitors to have to deal with it. And have I just put her in the crate? Absolutely. You know, but that's not. You know, I don't always know when the FedEx guy is going to show up. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. So there's got to be some like, okay, this isn't the best idea. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and and one thing that popped into my head while you were saying all of that, you know, talking about kind of the approach of at some point, how did you word it? There's something you said that like trigger memory and that's not coming to me, but basically, you know, talking about the positive, there's so much positive that we do. There's so much reward that we offer. Um, and, and that's a huge part of it, but you're always going to reach when you're dealing with fear and anxiety, you're going to reach a point that it's not enough. And then it becomes like an ultimatum, you know, you you can you can break command and you can and if you continue to do it, it's going to go up. Um, and so, using myself as an example, I know you're aware, but I, I had pretty severe social anxiety. I had what was called selective mutism. I just would I was not able to like speak around really most people. I spoke to my parents and my brothers. I think my grandparents. And that was about it. I didn't speak in school. I didn't talk to the other kids. I didn't talk to anybody. Um, and so I worked with counselors and therapists and my teachers at school who were amazing. And until the third grade, I had not spoken in school. I was eight years old and had not said a word in the classroom. Um, and we had gotten to a point uh, where my teacher was taking certain people aside with me and having me have like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, saying a few words around them. I had gotten that far, but we were kind of stuck there. And so finally I got the ultimatum and all that to say, like, we got a lot of positive reinforcement stuff. Like, okay, we practice things. Um, I remember I, I made a video in the therapist's office with me using hand puppets to talk so that I could hide, but to prove to my like classmates that I could speak because a lot of them thought I couldn't. And so they thought maybe that playing that video in the class would allow me to like feel more comfortable and that didn't end up working. Um, it helped bring some more understanding to the other kids, but it didn't get me talking. Um, having the amazing teachers and the rewards that I was offered, like that got to a certain point, but there still was like, I was failing the oral reading subjects and I could read just fine. I was failing certain things in school. So at the end of second grade, my parents told me, if you don't begin speaking in school, you will not go to the third grade. You will stay a grade behind because you're clearly not ready. And boy, was that some motivation. It was <laughs> pressure. Like it took my fear and put it here and made it here. And the thing was, but, but in a way that it was like my fear went up, but my desire to push past it went even right. higher. You know? And, and that's what we work with with these dogs is it's like sometimes you 
you put the pressure on them, which makes their fear go higher, which makes them go above threshold. But then you have this motivation there, even if it's a consequence that gets them past that hump. And, you know, being able to like answer a question in class for the first time was the hump. I was stuck. And I think it was because for that point, I had gone on for so long doing it a certain way that the thought of doing something different was just like I couldn't handle that. Answering a question out loud in class, but I've never done that before. What will the kids say? Wow. You know? Well, and that's so, like... There was no reward that could get me to answer a question out loud in class. There was no, like, snack. There was no, right. you know, nothing. And so... As you either answer a question in class or you don't graduate on to the next class. And I still remember the day that I did it because there was so much like intensity in that moment, but it was fine. And I remember what was cool is I remember like I wanted to puke. I wanted to cry. It was like awful. And I answered the question and I felt the like collective gasp of everyone like, oh my God, she spoke. And my teacher just moved us on. And then the relief that came from that was intense. And that's what we need to remember with the dogs. Like you push them over this hump and you imagine the relief they get when they realize they're okay. When they've spent so long thinking they're not like, that's a cool thing to do. And all of these people who don't believe in pushing a dog to that point probably have never experienced actually doing it. <laughs> like, because on the flip side of all that, it's incredible. And watching a dog, I, I remember one dog in particular who going out in public, similar to Gus Gus, but it was a different dog. He just stressed like crazy when we went out places and, and he was very vocal. So we'd go out into this um, tractor supply and he was the entire time <laughs> and talk about turning heads. Like you would think that I was sitting here kicking the dog with all the noises he was making. And it was just because we had walked through the door. And correcting him and practicing at home, we had done lots of um, down head downs and teaching him that like when your head is down, you go to a relaxed frame of mind. And so I was asking for him to do that in a, it was actually a feeder supply, so a pet store. Um, we were on the floor, not we, he was on the floor, <laughs> he was in a down. I'm trying to get him to put his head down. I'm giving him that command. He's refusing to do it because he's, he's overwhelmed. He's above threshold. I corrected him. He, again, he's very vocal. So he like yipped and yelped when I did. And it was one of those things that like, if someone just randomly walked around the corner and didn't know what was going on, they'd probably think I was like harming this dog, abusing this dog, but he knew what he was supposed to be doing. And finally, after another correction, he put his head down and he's shaking and he's tense. And all of a sudden he goes, and he just sighs. And his whole body goes soft. And then we get up and we walk in this nice soft heel. And it wasn't perfect like the rest of the trip. He had moments where he would start to get triggered. But then we would go back into a head down. And we'd just do it all over until he was able to walk around that store calmly. And he, his family had the same kind of success ongoing. Where they were able to take him out places where they couldn't before. So that's what we need to think about. Threshold is not something to avoid. It's a hump to get over. Well and we're doing it in a way that's methodical. And I think I, I think there's probably things that are worth pointing out because there are there are thresholds even we have as people, right, that are are reasonable. And every dog and we talk about this a lot. You know, every dog is different. We're not going to talk about breed. We're not going to talk about whatever because a dog is a dog is a dog. I mean, they're all they're 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 more like people than probably anybody wants to <laughs> go into processing sometimes. But um yeah. That, you know, there are thresholds that are, are probably not unreasonable. That you can go, look, this is a place you're not okay, and there's no reason for us to go there. We, I had when, same, the same guy who showed up and helped us with Portia the other day. He was able to stand there and let her come approach and figure it out. Also, um, <laughs> he had a lab. Oh, and he was such a, such a sweet dog and so good. That dog hated water. Hated it. The only lab you have ever, I mean, he is not getting in the pool. He is not doing any of the things. And you know what? So what? It didn't matter. They weren't like big lake goers. It didn't matter. They just went on and, and we can't hear you now, Rachel. You've probably turned it down too far. Um, or I can't. Um, it may, that may just be latency. But anyway, you know, it didn't, oh, now I can hear you. It didn't, 
it didn't okay. matter, you know, and that was one of those, like, you know what, this is a place you're not okay, and there's no reason for us to push it. We can, we can all be okay here. But if you can't go in public, if you can't go to take your dog to the potty, if you can't have anyone over to your home, or put the dog in the car and go for a ride to the vet, or any of these things, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, who wants to live that way? And your dog doesn't want to live that way. Yeah, there's certain basic functional things that you just need to be able to do with your dog. And you're right, there's certain things where you might be able to let it go knowing that you're just not going to ever encounter it and what's the big deal. Um, you know, if if water is the one thing that your dog totally freaks out about, but you don't really ever go out around water and don't care, then fine, so be it. Sometimes he's going to have to suck it up and get a bath, but whatever. Um, I will say, though, that sometimes what I do like to do is... so. Here's an example with Storm. You guys, if you've been following the Facebook page, you've probably seen videos of Clyde on the treadmill and not Storm. Storm is nowhere near ready to walk on the treadmill. She is terrified of the treadmill. Right? <laughs> is there any reason I need to make that dog walk on the treadmill? For practical purposes, no. I think it's handy when a dog will walk on a treadmill. It's nice. You can use it in inclement weather, but it's not necessary. However, every day I work her on that treadmill because she's terrified of it. And I want to teach her how to, how to take something you're afraid of and work through it. Mostly because, and again, with the dog that you were just talking about, that could be a totally different story if he's not struggling with his entire right. life. But Storm specifically struggles with anything that makes her uncomfortable having this huge reaction. And so... Um, I use the treadmill as going, okay, I know this makes her highly uncomfortable. So let's practice how we mitigate this reaction. Um, but on the same note, I've also taken it down to teeny ties, teeny tiny bite-sized pieces. Most dogs, when I teach them to walk on the treadmill, most dogs, you can pretty much turn that thing on. They might freak out for a moment. You give a little leash pressure um, and then they work it out and it's fine. It's no big deal. Storm, I am getting her on and off and clicking just for getting on the treadmill. Clicking food and off, clicking food and off. And she's gotten to where right now, initially, even that, she would be, I'm talking vocalizing, screaming, like it was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> you reach a point where you have, you have dramatics. And she was kind of starting to get into just the dramatic side, or I'm like, Storm, honey. Um, but even just like barely turning it on where you get the hum from the treadmill, but it's not actually really moving, totally freaks her out because she has experienced it starting to move and she's totally not okay with that. And so right now we're at the point of make it hum, get her to settle down enough that I can have my leash soft and then release her in food and then back on and repeat that. And every time we do that, it's easier to get her to absorb more. Will she be walking on the treadmill by the time her owners get pick her up? Probably not because she goes home in a couple days. She probably won't be full on walking on it like could tie a leash and just leave her there. But I'm still going to work on it because I can see her processing things better. So that's another kind of with dogs who struggle with fear or how they handle when they are above threshold. Seek out the things that make them uncomfortable. Break it down into really small pieces where you can help them out. And that's where we talk about guided flooding. You know, um, guided flooding, again, meaning you flood the dog, you put them, you immerse them in what they're fearful of, but you're guiding them in that they're not just like loose running around terrified. You know, it's easy to picture with like that traffic noise um, desensitization we were talking about. It wasn't just like stick it beside his crate. He's in there freaking out while I play traffic sounds. It's no, teach you that in the crate or on place, you're supposed to be in a down. You're supposed to be not barking, not spinning, not breaking place. You're supposed to be calm and quiet. Um, you give them those guidelines of what they should be doing, and then you are desensitizing them, or you're walking them in a heel, or whatever you're doing. Well, and um, but you're there. Isn't that and doesn't that Rachel also work towards you know relationship building with your dog? Like they're learning. Okay, I can trust this person. I can trust. Yeah. This person's telling me it's okay. Oh, yeah. I don't feel okay, but they're saying it's okay, so maybe we can be okay. Absolutely, and I think a lot of people are afraid that if they correct their dog, the dog won't trust them. But, and uh, give me some feedback here. Are you able to hear Storm snoring? Like, is it distracting? It's loud on my <laughs> I just maybe did. Now that they're going to be like, oh, yeah. I'm telling you, you might have to go give her a nudge in a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it really is. 
This dog can snore. Um, yeah. What were we just saying? The relationship building. So, you know, I was talking with Storm's owner about this earlier today. It's the same thing with like, and you and I have talked about this recently. Um, when you have a boss who has clear expectations versus a boss right. who doesn't, you know, we are pretty much all more comfortable. And I'm not going to say all, but generally speaking, we like knowing what's expected of us in our job. We want to know what we're supposed to be doing and what we're not supposed to be doing. And sometimes we find that out through a consequence, but you know, it happens once and then we go, Oh, don't do that again. Right. Got it. And it doesn't destroy your relationship with your boss. And if it does, you probably don't have a good right. boss. Like, <laughs> you know, and that's what we're going for with the dogs is that we're guiding them through this. We're teaching them boundaries. We're teaching them leadership. And, um, Oh, you're hearing the story <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. It's, it's, she is something else. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it is great for relationship building because the dog sees somebody who's in charge and it's not just about being in charge of the dog. You're in charge of your surroundings. Right. Yeah. And when they see that you are a take charge kind of person who's going to be leading them and keeping them safe, then you're going to build that trust and again, raise their threshold. And, you know, um, I said that right. That yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> To where they're going to be able to feel more comfortable in, you know, more intense situations. So, anyway, we're going to kind of wrap this up here. Any other? And honestly, I'm kind of wrapping this up because I think Mr. Uh, I think Mr. Clyde has to poop. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not going to stay on. Too oh, much come on, here. Rachel. In there, but um, what oh, was that? Come on, just clean it up. It'll be fine. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> Like him if I just let the dog poop in our room. <laughs> <and fly. laughs> so, um, so yeah. Well, on that note, <laughs> why with the animals? Why is it always we have to end on a note about like poop or vomit or something? Like yeah, why? You know. <laughs> or at least it always comes up. Um, but anyway, so that is that is what we've got for you guys about threshold and and um, the importance of bringing that dog there, working them over it, teaching them how to cope. And the end result of doing that repeatedly and in a methodical way that the dog can understand is a dog who is more confident in themselves, more confident in you, in their surroundings. And it just, you can really open up your, your world for the dog. So do you have any, any other comments to wrap up with? Or? No, I think the only thing I'd like to leave everybody with is, you know, since we're just kind of getting going with these, if you have, um, especially like Joy, thank you, Joy. Joy's tuned, tuned in two weeks in a row, which is amazing. Um, but if you... Thanks, Timothy. I know he's been on the Facebook yes, page yes. a lot. Um, if you guys have any ideas of things that you want to, you know, want us to talk about that you've seen Rachel do some videos you want to know more in depth about or... You know, feel free to, to DM us on Facebook or messages here or leave a comment on the live stream, however, um, you know, however you want to do it. But just, you know, we're always want to know what you guys want to know and, you know, feel free to let us know what you want to know about. Cool. And thank you, Joy. Thank you guys for, for watching us and, and chatting with us. And so we'll plan on being here next Tuesday evening again. We'll we'll post out there what the exact time is going to be um, when we get a little closer. Yep. But it'll be in the evening, Tuesday evening next week. And we will hopefully see you guys there. Bye, guys. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Sarah. <laughs> Bye.